A mim gostaria de apresentar Olivier Goulet, que é, uh, em mim, para mim, ponto de vista, uh, uma das maiores autoridades mundiais sobre a insuficiência intestinal, e num serviço muito ativo, um grande número de pacientes em intestino curto e insuficiência intestinal. Uh, Dr. Goulet é professor de pediatria da Universidade Paris City Sorbonne e da Paris Descartes Medical School. Uh, o hospital que ele maneja é o Hospital Necker Enfant de Malheur, em Paris, em la região central de Paris, é muito lindo. E, doutor Olivier, nós outros invitamos para que, como uma atividade do Working Group de insuficiência intestinal, para que o Olivier nos fale sobre diarreia congênita, sobre as enteropatias congênitas, uh, que é uma situação muito uh, difícil de manejar, de fechar o diagnóstico, de encerrar o diagnóstico. E o Olivier tem uma experiência de muitos anos trabalhando com esse tipo de, de situação. Então, vai nos dar com certeza muitas informações que científicas sobre o ponto e muito de lá experiência personal com esse tipo de paciente. Então, eu vou a passar a palavra ao Olivier e ao final nós vamos podemos fazer um debate, mas eh, também podemos receber perguntas, eh, questionamentos por o chat do Zoom. Eh, vamos organizando as, as perguntas e nos apresentamos ao Olivier ao final. Mas também vai ser possível fazer perguntas uh, de forma personal. Então, Olivier, por favor, nos diz tudo o que precisamos saber sobre a congenital enteropathy causando intestinal pain. Obrigado. Thank you, thank Go you, ahead, Jose. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, buenas noches to everybody. And uh, it's noches for me in Paris. It's uh, past uh, 11. And uh, thank you very much, Jose, for your kind introduction. And thank you for the invitation to give this uh, webinar on one of my favorite topic. And I will try to be short in uh, for, for a very long story because the story started a long time ago. And uh, at that time, it was not obvious that part of those uh, diarrhea and severe early onset diarrhea were caused by genetic disorder and may cause permanent intestinal failure. And uh, first of all, the definition of intestinal failure is the inability of the GI tract to provide sufficient digestion absorption capacities to cover nutritional requirements for growth and development of the child. As you know, intestinal failure has become a very important topic covering short bowel syndrome, neuromuscular disease, and also congenital enteropathies. And intestinal failure may be provisional or permanent and for some definite. And uh, I would like to come back to uh, some issue. Uh, in our experience from our own paradigm nutrition program, out of almost 400 children enrolled during the last 20 years, we have around 7% represented by congenital enteropathies. It's nothing regarding short bowel syndrome or even neuromuscular intestinal disease. But what is interesting is such a disease like enteropathy, a rare disease, is that we can have a clinical approach from the bedside to the lab of both genetic and cell biology. That means that those enteropathies has become like a model for understanding the development of the human gut. And if I summarize my talk, 
I will talk about this defect of the digestion absorption or transport of nutrients and electrolytes causing an osmotic diarrhea. The second part will be devoted to the defect of enterocytes differentiation and proliferation. Shortly, I will cover some defect of the enteroendocrine cell differentiation, and I will not cover the defect of modulation of the intestinal immune response, which are for most immune deficiency like. But the story starts more than 50 years ago when Avery described the so called syndrome of intractable diarrhea of infancy. And it was defined by diarrhea occurring in infants younger than three months of age, lasting more than two weeks with three or more negative stool culture for bacterial pathogens. And those children were managed in hospital using intravenous fluids while diarrhea was persistent and for some intractable. The mortality rate was high, both from infection and malnutrition. And my boss, my mentor, Claude Ricourt, designed a study about 10 years after. He uh, go, went back to 180 cases requiring total or parenteral nutrition. And the counts were 32 deaths, 18% from infection and malnutrition. And the etiology was recognized only in 10% of cases, including microvillus atrophy, saccharase deficiency, glucose galactose transport deficiency, Anderson disease, Wallman disease, and protein losing enteropathy, which is not a disease, it's just a symptom, and suspected immune deficiency. And what did change during the first decades? After the discussion of Avery, after the work of Claude Ricourt, what changed was the management of malnutrition by parenteral nutrition, but also the histopathological studies allowing to classify the intractable diarrhea of infancy and to design specific management. Interestingly, at least in Europe, we have published three papers covering this uh, early onset severe diarrhea of infancy. One, two from Italy and one from France. And as you can see, most of the case occur during the first months of life and especially in the French series. And I did another new study 20 years after the rigor study and the inclusion criteria was more strict age below two years, parenteral nutrition for months and one month, and excluding documented immune deficiency, congenital birth defect, and motility disorder. And interestingly, what we have seen, only 60 consecutive cases, but the design of the study was different. The mortality rate was lower, 10%, from infection and also intestinal transplantation. And the etiological diagnosis was successful in 90% of cases. And we designed two types of diarrhea, the protracted diarrhea that can recover and the intractable diarrhea of infancy. And among the protracted, you have the intestinal transport defect, the post enterotitis diarrhea, severe colitis, some CDG syndrome, ganglioneuroblastoma, and some in that say undefined diarrhea. And on the other side, 21 infants were had intractable diarrhea, causing intestinal failure, requiring long-term parenteral nutrition. And among this group, epithelial dysplasia, also called congenital tufting enteropathy, account for six, microvirus atrophy three, autoimmune enteropathy five, phenotypic diarrhea three and non-defined four, but it was more than 20 years ago. And I did a work, a European survey for collecting data from Europe. 
and in order to uh, obtain and to describe a classification. And the classification at the time was congenital disorder of ep intestinal epithelium, including microvillus atrophy, epithelial dysplasia. And the second form was syndromatic diarrhea with dysmorphism. I will cover this. And T cell activation related enteropathy close to X linked autoimmune enteropathy and any immune and autoimmune enteropathy. I will give a few words about this category. But what is very important for the clinician is that the initial, the very early semiological analysis should collect the following information. The family history and the consanguinity. The prenatal manifestation as polyhydramnios. The delay for onset of severe diarrhea. The characteristic and the aspect of the diarrhea. The relationship with the type of feeding. The evolution of diarrhea at bowel rest persistent or resuming, and the extra digestive manifestation. If you collect all this data, you may perform a clinical diagnosis of, of very, very rare disease. And if you look at this um, pathway, is this um, algorithm, the first information is about the onset of diarrhea. And the second is the persistence or not of the diarrhea at borel rest, nothing by the enteral root. It persists, it's reduced, or it disappears. And from that, just the sign of the response to borel rest, you may start to have some orientation about the diarrhea. And Indeed, if you add the family history, the consanguinity, the type of diarrhea, the search for dysmorphism, the search for protein losing enteropathy, etc., etc., you may find many, many different disorders, and including microvillus inclusion disease, but also including the glucose galactose malabsorption. The difference between both is that this one persists at borel rest and this one disappears at borel rest. And with the clinical case I select, you will understand why the clinical analysis is very important. And conversely, cow's milk protein allergy or hypex autoimmune enteropathy, as well as sucrose deficiency, are rarely of early neonatal onset. The case of Mireille. Mireille parents without any past history. It was the first pregnancy marked by polyhydramnios. C-section, birth weight almost normal for the term, but a bit small for gestational age. And this child was sent to ICU for a short ventilation period. And it was noticed that she had abundant output of something, was stool or urine. And as a pediatric gastroenterologist, you were asked to have your advice. And the question you should ask were, are the following. The question, the first one is, date of meconium emission? And the answer is, I don't know. The aspect of stool output, oh, it looks like urine, okay. Are the stool persisting at borrowed rest? Yes, but yes. The aspect of urine output, I don't know, because probably there is a mixture with stool. The evolution of the body weight during the first day of life. And what about the electrolyte of this child? And the day after, you have the answer, especially about the electrolytes data. And back to you, the neonatologist said, ah, oh, the child has hypochloremia, 
metabolic alkalosis, and hypokalemia. There is no chloride urinary exception. And I collect the stool, and the chloride is higher than the sum of sodium and potassium. Ah. You are very clever, and you have the diagnosis. What is the diagnosis? Congenital chloride diarrhea. No biopsy, no endoscopy, nothing, only a blood, urine, and stool sampling. And the treatment is hydration, hydration, sodium and potassium chloride supplementation, and the prognosis is excellent. This disease can be recognized during pregnancy by the prenatal diagnosis, first by ultrasound showing bowel distension, sometimes by amniotic function because of the hydramnios and the, 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 the the pattern is the pattern of what is called fetal diarrhea. And if you have the notion, the knowledge that there is one case in the family, there is very easy to perform a gene analysis showing the mutation SLC26A3. And it, that's it. This child survived. She's doing very well. I am following her. And it's an easy diagnostic without any investigation. And the congenital sodium diarrhea caused polyhydramnios, bowel distension with dilated intestinal loop, prematurity, severe neonatal diarrhea, no meconium expulsion, autosomal recessive. Um, the pathophysiology, it's a sodium absorption deficit with an increased chloride excretion, especially from the colon. And it was proposed by, um, uh, I don't remember his name, it's an Italian guy, uh, Bernini, that the short chain fatty acid infusion may increase the, 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 the disease. And we have not this experience because to have short chain fatty acid available is quite difficult. But anyway, the prognosis is very good, not very poor, because uh, all the child, all the children should survive. And sometimes, unfortunately, there are some deaths in utero because of polyhydramnios and dilated intestinal loops. What I have never seen in my life, which is extremely rare, it's the congenital sodium diarrhea caused by two different mutations. And probably this disease is fatally, prenatally lethal, causing abortion. And uh, very, very few children survive if any one survives already. And this very rare disease is now very well identified and justified when detected a prenatal diagnosis. The case of Amel, parents without past history, origin Morocco, but the couple is consanguineous. It is the first pregnancy with a prematurity, the birth weight is 2000 gram and the age is 46 centimeter. And Amel was breastfed, but by breastfeeding, she had uh, severe watery diarrhea, causing severe dehydration and moving her to the NICU with hypernatremia. She was recognized as, as having no stool at bowel rest, and she was refed with protein hydrolysate instead of restarting breastfeeding. And on protein hydrolysate, uh, Protein hydrolysate, the, the, the severe watery diarrhea relapse. And again, no stool at bowel rest. It, she was restarted with breastfeeding and diarrhea relapse. And she was fed with elemental diet, neocate, and the severe watery diarrhea relapse. 
she was put on total parenteral nutrition and the diarrhea disappeared. She was transferred to our specialized units and she was really very, very malnourished when she was admitted at three months of age with severe malnutrition. And what we did is just a dietetic analysis and total parenteral nutrition. As you can see, on total parenteral nutrition, she was able to gain weight. No worry with the nutrition. But what is this strange diarrhea of early onset unresponsive to different diets, but disappearing at bowel rest? What is your hypothesis? And which investigation we should perform? What we did first is what I call a dietetic analysis. And indeed, if you look at the different diets, the breastfeeding, the mother milk is containing lactose, meaning glucose and galactose, causing diarrhea. Pepti Junior protein hydrolysate is maltose dextrin, glucose only, no galactose, no fructose. The same for Neocate, but always causing diarrhea. She was not fed with a regular infant formula containing lactose and saccharose, but nothing knows what would happen. But if you look at this table, what was missing? A diet containing no glucose and no galactose. And we start this child with this diet called galactomin 819, containing only fructose and the diarrhea did not relapse. The child recover, gaining weight, and we stop very rapidly parenteral nutrition. And the glucose tolerant test confirm the disease, which is glucose galactose transport deficiency. And she was fed with galactomin 19. We did not perform any biopsy, any endoscopy. And it's a very, very classical disease. I am sure this disease is worldwide. And most of the cases are coming from the Arabic region. But we have also uh, uh, local French family involved with this deficit. And she recovered very nicely. And again, I am following this girl and she's doing very well. And she's today almost normally fed. And that disease is caused by the HGL, SGLT1 located, uh, deficit gene mutation located on chromosome 22. And she's, uh, uh, it, it, it is a pure deficit of the transfer of glucose and galactose, which have a, a common transporter. And it, there is no manifestation prenatally. There is no indication for prenatal diagnosis because it's a very, very good prognosis disease, except if you have such a child with congenital sodium uh, glucose galactose deficiency, you should avoid absolutely the use of glucose based oral rehydration solution. Why? Because by giving glucose in the time of severe gastroenteritis, you will, will kill the child because you will increase the diarrhea and the dehydration, and you can lose the child and you have to design a special ORS containing only fructose. But with this condition, the prognosis is excellent on long term. And the evolution of the child confirmed this aspect. She's growing very nicely. And interestingly, we have also the experience of another deficiency, which uh, is quite complex but require also dietetic challenge and analysis because this disease also disappear at bowel rest. And the first diagnosis, because 
the glucose galactose deficiency is much more frequent than the, the deficit I will talk about, we have to go to diet challenge. And if all these diets are failing to improve the child because of the relapse of diarrhea, you have to move to another hypothesis, which are the lipid deficiency, lipid transport deficiency. And one of the most recent description of those deficiency is the DGAT1 deficiency. DGAT1 is related to the deficit in an enzyme with, within the enterocytes. And it caused the accumulation of lipid within the enterocytes, impairing the epithelium, injuring the epithelium, causing protein losing enteropathy, hypoalbuminemia, et cetera, et cetera, with vomiting. And it's a severe design, severe presentation, but just by the diet challenge, you may point the hypothesis of DGAT1 deficiency, which can be confirmed by intestinal biopsy and especially molecular biology. That is to uh, tell you that uh, we may perform the diagnostic of such severe enteropathy just by clinical analysis. And it's true also for other disease. We have reviewed some example of this category disappearing at Borel West and some reducing at Borel West like chloride diarrhea. No word about sodium diarrhea. But now we will move to this category of congenital enteropathy, which are much more severe and complex. And the first one, and the first described in that category, is an autosomal recessive disease, which is called microvillus inclusion disease or microvillus atrophy. Most of the cases are on, of Arabic or Turkish origin, much more than Caucasian origin. I think that in your Latin America, you should not uh, um, meet some case uh, very frequently. But it's marked by an hydramnios with fetal diarrhea. The diarrhea is very, very early onset and is characterized by abnormal brush border, as you can see, and intracytoplasmic uh, secretory granule, as you can see on the left bottom of the slide. And it causes severe and permanent intestinal failure. And the villus atrophy is moderate. There is no mucosal T cell infiltration. The brush border is abnormal. And you can easily perform the diagnostic by regular intestinal biopsy and by using the periodic acid shift staining, showing abnormal brush border, like you can see on this slide. And if you compare a control and the disease, there is no doubt that this is normal and that is strongly abnormal. You cannot recognize brush border because the brush border does not exist. You can use this staining or this staining and you have almost the same picture with the contrast between normal and abnormal microvillus, in, uh, microvillus uh, surface. And the defect uh, of this disease is probably in the trafficking of the uh, microvilli. But it's not clear today, but one hypothesis which is much more supported today is that microvilli are generated during the development of the mucosa. But finally, there is like an endocytotic process that include microvilli particle within the enterocyte, as you can see here. And the second characteristic is, as I have shown on the previous slide, the secretory, secretory granule. And 
by collecting case in 2008 with the help of several uh, European centers, including our center, it, it has been uh, shown that this disease was caused by a mutation called Myo5b. And this pro uh, protein is involved in the self cell trafficking. But by telling that, we don't explain exactly the mechanism of the disease. Uh, we have in the lab reproduce or try to reproduce by using Kakodo cells culture of knockout, uh, uh, knockout line. And as you can see here, it's a disease pattern and here it's a normal pattern. And it's clear that it's totally different. Here, the microvilli are very sparse, and here, abundant. And it's an interesting model in the lab. But to treat those patients without any enzyme activity, transport activity, causing not only osmotic diarrhea if you fed the child, feed the child, and also secretory diarrhea. And we uh, have published a few years ago, a decade ago, the largest series of this disease uh, from our center. It's a model center study. And we describe an associated disorder called the bilary disease, suggesting that there is some link between this development of microvilli and the bilary secretion. And until now, we don't know exactly how these two disorders can be associated. But those children who have the phenotype with bilary disease have a very, very chronic and severe pruritus. And today, it's really a question. And the long-term outcome of this disease is very bad. You can perform very properly the parenteral nutrition, but the child is at high risk of dehydration because of the digestive loads that can reach up to 300 milliliters a day, a per kilo per day. You imagine if you lose the central line, the child can die from dehydration within a few hours. And for that reason, it does become an indication of intestinal transplantation or combined intestinal and liver transplantation in case of associated bilary disease. We published in 2011 a series of 14 patients who underwent uh, uh, liver small bowel or isolated small bowel transplantation with all the time the association of the right colon. And the median follow-up at five years was 100% for the patient with isolated, only 66% of patient and graft survival in the liver small bile transplantation. But the result has have to be adjusted because some late graft loss change. But during the last decade, we have had other transplantation and the final five years uh, follow-up survival are almost the same. But uh, whatever is a saving procedure because of the risk of dehydration. And interestingly, it was identified first the Myo 5B uh, mutation, and which is a protein involved in the regulation of the circulation of intracellular protein and the organization of the cytoskeleton. We don't know the role of Myo 5B, the bilary secretion. But a second mutation has been shown, which is STX3, which is an apical receptor involved in the membrane fusion of apical vesicle of the enterocytes. But interestingly, in that case, there is no microvillus inclusion. And a third different mutation, third different genotype, causing almost the same clinical and histopathological uh, no, clinical presentation may be caused by the mutation of a gene named UNC45A. 
and it's a loss of function mutation causing a syndrome associating cholestasis, diarrhea, impaired hearing, and bone fragility. That means that, again, if you are facing to a microvillus inclusion disease without the capacity to approach a molecular diagnosis. If there is the association, phenotypic association of diarrhea, cholestasis, impaired hearing, and bone fragility, you can make the diagnosis of this mutation. If you have isolated diseases, much more in favor of myo5b, if you have both diarrhea, severe diarrhea, uh, characteristic picture on histopathology, and pruritus, you may uh, uh, consider the diagnostic of myo5b gene mutation. In summary, this disease is an autosomal recessive disease with an incidence which is very, very difficult to estimate. But in France, at least, we consider that it's probably between 100 and 200 live births. The role of consanguinity is huge. And in France, we have some consanguinous EUS community. And there are several Myo5b mutation and genotype. There are several genotypes for the same phenotype. There is associated disease such as biliary secretion disease. It's a difficult management of digestive loads. It's an indication for intestinal transplantation. And the pre prenatal diagnosis should be performed by both US and genetic approach because it's such a severe disease justifying the uh, interruption of the pregnancy, at least in our policy. Another disease which is interesting, it's called intestinal epithelial dysplasia or recall tufting enteropathy. And this disease is a very strange one and associating very characteristic histopathological change, including tuft formation, dilated glands, and also like abnormal glands with two parts. And this disease cause also a very severe neonatal onset diarrhea. And it cause for most cases, definite intestinal failure requiring either parenteral nutrition or intestinal transplantation. When we described the disease in 95, we have had the feeling that this disease could be caused by something related to adhesion of the enterocyte between each other. And we have seen at that time abnormal basement membrane by using different staining, the laminin staining, the HS heparin sulfate proteoglycan staining. And a few years later, we published in gastroenterology an other paper showing that in that disease, there was a, like a balonization of the enterocytes with very few uh, and very poor brush border, but also something very strange, a higher expression of the desmoglein protein with very, very strong tight junction. And finally, this disease was also in some case associated with an other disease. And we detect in some children what we call a superficial punctiform keratitis and associated with a conjunctival, ah, the picture is missing, disappear, a conjunctival disease looking like the intestinal epithelium. And finally, in California, in San Diego, from three cases from the Canadian group, they identified the first mutation causing this interesting disease. And the mutation is caused by the EPCAM mutation. And EPCAM is called epithelial cellular adhesion molecule. That means that more than 10 years before, we had the feeling that something was wrong in the adhesion molecule process. 
And this protein is expressed on the lateral side of most normal epithelial cells membrane, as well as on proliferating epithelial tumor. And cell adhesion receptors are morpho-regulating molecules mediating crosstalk between cell and between cell and their environment, including the basement membrane. And interestingly, there are several types of EPGAN mutation. We have not today the knowledge of a link between some mutation and the phenotype, but probably some mutation are less severe than other. And we have performed with Julie Salomon from our group an interesting study when I came back from Saudi Arabia with a collection of blood sample and DNA. And uh, she was able to demonstrate that it was what we call a founding effect mutation uh, in the Arabic Gulf. And indeed, most of the cases described all around the world are from Arabic origin with a migration up to France and any place in Europe. And what we have done, it, we, we, we have done a phenotypic analysis of this tufting enteropathy or intestinal epithelial dysplasia. And indeed, we have uh, uh, studied 42 families with 58 patients and with 73% consanguinity. And we divide the group with only digestive disease in 67% of the case and associated anomalies. And by this approach, we have been able to describe the conjunctival disease, the association with coanal atresia in some case, or digestive astresia, esophageal or rectal, the air skin abnormalities, and the bone disease. And some children had thalassemia, which has nothing to do with the digestive disease. But what is interesting, we describe an associated anomalies in 12 families out of uh, more than 60. And those 12 had keratitis and conjunctival disease. You have here the picture of conjunctival disease with punctiform keratitis. And it's a picture of coanal atresia. And interestingly, we describe an other mutation, which is called SPIN2 mutation. And SPIN2 mutation correspond to a serine protease inhibitor it's type 2. And it's also an adhesion molecule. But what is interesting is that cause digestive and extra digestive disease. And again, if you have the typical histopathological picture associated with atresia, with conjunctival disease, you may perform the diagnosis of this disease without using genetic, but it's better to have the genetic confirmation. And indeed, just by the clinical analysis, the, immunos the, the histopathological staining showing on the picture on the left that there is no expression of the EPCAN protein. And conversely, in the SPIN2 form, there is an expression of EPCAM. And expression of EPCAM, same histopathological picture with stuffed, but with associated disorder, conjunctival disease, etc., is corresponding to a SPIN2 mutation. Probably there are some other mutations causing the same phenotype, but nowadays we have no uh, gene candidate. The tufting enteropathy, we should perform phenotype genotype studies. We use to perform systematically on uh, regular biopsy EPCAM staining. The prenatal diagnosis is possible and recommended because it's a severe 
sorry, it's a severe disease. You cannot predict the prognosis. And uh, for that reason, because of the intestinal failure caused by the disease, there is reasonable to perform prenatal diagnosis. And indeed, we develop in our institution the prenatal diagnosis for both microbilus and EPCAM uh, mutation, uh, epithelial dysplasia. A third entity is interesting. When uh, we describe this, I call this disease syndromatic diarrhea or phenotypic neonatal diarrhea. Why? Because those children look like sister and brother. This one come from Lebanon, this one from Algeria, and this one from Italy. But they look like, not the same, but close and looking like brother and sister. And it was our first approach, our understanding, the fact that those children look like each other and have in common to have a neonatal onset, severe diarrhea, and in some also a liver disease. And there are some other phenotypes which are looking almost the same. And one of the characteristics of this disease is the abnormal air. And the air are very, very thin and woolly and are involved by what is called trichorexis nodosa. Trichorexis nodosa is not uh, specific to the disease, but is characteristic from the disease. That means if you have a child with early onset diarrhea, with this face, with for aid, uh, for aid, proeminent for aid, with uh, hyperterroris, with very, very strange air, we can perform a electro not electron microscopy, a polarized uh, microscopy. And if you have this picture, you have your diagnosis. And indeed, these child are characterized by for some consanguinity, small for gestational age in all cases when we first describe the disease. Facial dysmorphism, gross failure, for some mental retardation, and immune deficiency, very non-specific and variable immune deficiency. And when we described that in 94, we were really surprised and no explanation and no sense disease why the association of facial dysmorphism, air abnormalities, and diarrhea. And it looks like a very, very strange disease. And fortunately, because the disease was associated with severe liver disease, in some case, in half of the case in our first series. And the British from Birmingham discover the first mutation causing this disease. And because they enter the disease by the liver, they call this disease the trichohepatoenteric syndrome, also called as THES. And this THES is caused by the TTC37 mutation. And uh, it's a severe disease with a very poor prognosis and no indication for intestinal transplantation because of the associated disorder. One child was transplanted, was uh, uh, received a bone marrow transplantation, but he died finally from the digestive disease. And my colleague, uh, Alexandre Fabre, describe a second mutation published in 2012. And this mutation is called the SKHIV2L mutation. And it's a gene encoding another sky complex cofactor. And the complex cofactor are very, very uh, important in the, uh, in the cell regulation. And it, it, it's very complex involving the regulation of mRNA expression. Sorry, that means that, again, this phenotype may be associated with or without liver disease, may be caused by at least two different mutations, TTC37, 
NSKV2L, which are close in terms of involvement of the mRNA function. But we have some other case without only uh, without any of these two mutations. That means something has to be done. Again, it's a severe disease, and we have currently six patients currently on home parenteral nutrition for this particular disease. And we will soon publish the case of these six children. There are other diseases, and indeed very, very rare disease, only described in one of two cases, and integrin disease close to adhesion molecule uh, expression disease, mitochondrial cytopathy, heparin sulfate proteoglycan deficiency, but also some form of CDG syndrome. I cannot describe and make the list of all the disease, but again, those diseases I told about can be easily uh, recognized and those diseases are more or less elimination disease. That means if you rule out the other disease I told about, you may consider such disease if the uh, diagnosis is not performed. A few words about autoimmune enteropathy causing postnatal diarrhea. And the historical definition of this autoimmune enteropathy definition or description was performed by McCarthy in 78, the same year than Avery, and involving boy with diarrhea, IgA deficiency, villus atrophy, and anti anthrocyte antibody. A few years later, Answorth and Walker Smith describe what they consider initially as celiac disease, but refractory celiac disease on gluten-free diet. And they had severe persistent diarrhea without any immune deficiency, but manifestation of autoimmunity. And finally, the definition of autoimmune enteropathy is persistent severe diarrhea with villus atrophy, massive mononuclear infiltration of the lamina propria, T cell mediated inflammation, autoimmunity as experienced by auto circulating autoantibodies without any classical immune deficiency. And the typical symptoms are massive persistent diarrhea and some bloody diarrhea, protein losing enteropathy, parenteral nutrition dependency, with in some cases dermatological atopic eczema with hyper IgE, with the association of neonatal type 2, type 1 diabetes, thyroiditis, with hematological characteristics like positive coups, hemolytic anemia, thrombocytopenia, and again, circulating antibody. That means that if you face with a boy, because this first category of autoimmune enteropathy, which is the best documented and the first described called hypex syndrome as immune dysregulation, polyendocrinopathy, autoimmune enteropathy, X-linked syndrome. That is the definition of hypex syndrome. If you are facing to a child, two, two months of age, after vaccination or after stopping breastfeeding, starting with severe diarrhea and developing uh, type one diabetes in a boy, you have already the diagnosis of autoimmune enteropathy and you have to start the treatment. And we have had many, not many, but some case, uh, at least 15 case before we decide to perform a bone marrow transplantation. That is a characteristic of the histopathology of this disease. And with very severe infiltration, the destruction of epithelium and all, you cannot recognize a normal biopsy, and especially in this picture. And that is a staining showing autoantibodies against enterocytes 
by using the indirect immunofluorescent staining, by using normal biopsy on which you put the serum of the patient and you reveal the picture by using anti-serum with immunofluorescence, which is called uh, indirect immunofluorescence. And we have had the chance to be associated to the description by Paul Wildin of this hypex syndrome, and uh, which is an equivalent of the uh, uh, of the gene uh, described in the mouse scurvy. And this hypex syndrome is characterized by immune dysregulation, polyendocrinopathy, autoimmune enteropathy, X linked. And it is interesting because it's related to the FOXP3 gene, which is very important in the maturation and differentiation and function of the T regulating cells, CD4 and CD25. And it is a disease of the T cell regulation. And this disease we have had, we, we faced in the past, like in this child with very severe dermatitis, hyper EGE and type one diabetes. And if you have this association with diarrhea, you can in a boy, you can perform the diagnosis. And we decide to perform the first bone marrow transplantation ever performed. And this transplantation was successful with the correction of the intestinal mucosa and the disappearance of the type 1 diabetes. Unfortunately, this child died two years later from iatrogenic complication. But our experience with autoimmune enteropathy caused by EPEX is not as good as we described in the past. And today we do prefer to use first line treatment steroid and promptly associated either with tacrolimus or better sirolimus. It's our schedule today. We describe with Frank Rumeleux two other types of hypex-like syndrome involving both girl and boy. And we have also some children with autoimmune enteropathy, boy or girl, but restricted to the GI tract without any extra digestive manifestation. And those diseases are also supported by the treatment I told about. But don't, um, don't, don't mix the digestive expression of immune deficiency, the autoimmune enteropathy, IPEX or like IPEX, and the so-called very early onset IBD, which are for most considered as immune deficiency caused by for most documented mutation like CIAP, IL-10 receptor mutation, IL-2 or CTLA-4. And there is a totally different uh, presentation and the presentation of those diseases, this one, are severe colitis, with also enteritis mimicking IBD. But I don't like the term very early onset IBD because they are not IBD as a classical IBD, even if they have some similarities. And finally, a few words about enteroendocrine uh, uh, deficiency. And they are very, very rare. We are only less than 10 cases in our experience and caused by a gene responsible for the development of the enteroendocrine cells. And it showed that enteroendocrine cells are mandatory for intestinal absorption process. And uh, they are more or less neglected player in the gastrointestinal disorder, but they are a new, uh, view today, and you are also by eliminating the other diagnostic to try to look at this hypothesis. But it's a hypothesis; it's quite difficult to evidence. And uh, if you look at the presentation, these three patients published in 2006, the diarrhea was uh, permanent in the patient one, whatever the diet. 
but uh, in some other, uh, it was not documented, but you can consider that diarrhea is a constant sign of this disease. But to evidence this disease, you have to perform specific staining showing that, for example, in this normal control, you may uh, stain the enterohendocrine cell. And in this, but in this picture, and if you compare this disease and this normal, you may, and it's require special staining, but that can be done by sending the biopsy specimen in, in any patho, uh, pathological lab. If you need help, we can help you. And finally, uh, if you follow me, you may recognize the first group causing osmotic diarrhea from defi deficit of digestion absorption disappearing at borel rest. Those corresponding to anomalies of enterocyte development causing secretory osmotic diarrhea. Those causing chronic secretory diarrhea caused by loss of homeostasy of the intestinal immune system with inflammation and villus atrophy. And the last group, osmotic diarrhea, caused by abnormal differentiation of intestinal neuroendocrine steam cells. That is the, I would say, genetic approach just to classify the genetic and pathophysiological approach. But back to the clinical approach. Remember that by using this, uh, this pathway, this uh, um, guideline, you should be able to have, just by clinical analysis, familial history, etc. I will not repeat, you may have an orientation of the diagnosis. And we have the chance today, at least in our institution, to have a panel of genetic of Jane. And by uh, collecting DNA rapidly, we can have within a few weeks the diagnosis and the molecular diagnosis of the suspected disease. But my personal pleasure is to perform the diagnosis clinically and histologically and to have the confirmation from the genetic lab. Thank you for your attention. Muito obrigado. You can hear me? Yes, thank you very much, Olivier. Wow, was <laughs> it's a wonderful. Uh, we, I will see if we have any question. We don't have any question. I just have people saying that it was wonderful your talk. Um, do you have an idea why um, this? Uh, most of these diseases are not very common for us in South America. Uh, you, you, in I would say in Latin people uh, in Europe, uh, these kind of diseases are common, or most of patients are really coming from uh, the Middle East and other places, as you showed. That is a good question. You know that both Latin America and Europe are countries of uh, migration. It's clear that we are much closer to the Arabic region than you. And it explains probably that in Europe, both in Spain, in Netherlands, in the UK, you have the, uh, this case and most of the work has been done in Europe. But if you look at a country like Canada, Canada has uh, migration coming from Europe, but coming also from all around the world, and they have case exactly the same. In addition, in Canada, I did not talk about the CDG syndrome, but in Canada, there are some uh, cluster of consanguinity like we have in Europe and in France 
like in Spain, Germany, uh, Netherlands, etc., and UK, there are people, uh, immigrated people, living in more or less community with consanguineous marriage. And indeed, in your population, there are much more uh, uh, melting pot and much less, probably much less consanguinity. And it's true that most, if not all disease I told about, are autosomal recessive disease. Very few are dominant, but most are, if not all, are autosomic. And consanguinity increase a lot the incidence of such autosomal disease. And when I travel to, for example, uh, North Africa, Algeria, Morocco, Tunisia, they are for most unable to perform the diagnosis, except if they send some specimen, either from biopsy or DNA, but they have a lot of such disease because it's a typical Arabic country. I have nothing uh, against, I have a... yeah, I have nothing against Arabic people, but the trueness is that they have some mutation probably with the expression, the population expression increased by the consanguinity. Yeah, I have a question from Dr. Josefina Martinelli from Hospital Italiano de Buenos Aires. Um, she uh, say, thank you very much for your excellent presentation. Do children with glucose galactose malabsorption develop a liver steatosis NASH uh, in the long term? If so, would the keto diet may be suggested? No, uh, in my experience, it's a very, very uh, simple disease. And you know that uh, uh, I love the intestinal microbiota. And uh, uh, I know that uh, children with this disease can be finally almost normally fed with carbohydrates, including glucose and galactose. Why? Because they have a malabsorption but there are more or less an adaptation and a recycling of the carbohydrates through the intestinal microbiota. And excessively restricted diet may cause finally something anormal. And my feeling and my practice is to try as much as possible to be, uh, to exit from excessively restrictive diet. And being confident in the microbiota to make the adaptation because it's a question of survival. And in, in, the, in the Arabic regions, they have the same experience. Probably they are more restricted than I am, but, but it's a very, very easy prognosis, simple prognosis, and, and there's no worry about this. And please don't be too restrictive in the diet but not to be uh, liberal, but be careful and allow to the child and the family to move slowly to an almost normal diet. Mm -hmm. well, uh, we've seen uh, very few patients with uh, this kind of disease. One was uh, a DJ81 deficiency, which was a child that was before on uh, TPN, but uh, we start a low uh, fat diet for, for the child and it develops very well. It's now out of TPN and, uh, uh, and uh, following very nicely the diets and it's so really wonderful. Uh, what you think is the prognosis of these patients in long time? So when it become, it, this is a, a infant at this moment, but uh, about which disease are, are you talking? DG, DJ, no, ah, CDG, CDG syndrome. Say glycosidation yeah. protein defect. Yes, the prognosis. Yeah. The prognosis when the disease is involving the digestion and there is a digestive expression. In my experience, the prognosis is quite, it's quite uh, favorable. But they will keep all life uh, without 
most lipids in the diet. There is uh, no other thing to do for them. Yeah. But you know that okay. if you have very, very few diseases like those I described and I told about, you should have very, very few, the so-called very early onset IBD, because the very early onset IBD for most are autosomal recessive disease. Have you a lot of case of very early, this early onset immune related disease? Yes, we have seen, I have uh, in the group of uh, uh, infants that uh, we, we diagnose uh, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, we have two children, one with, uh, that was, we got a positive exoma, one was uh, IL-2R, two, IL uh, uh, the mutation, mutation, and the other one was a XIAP. Both uh, are, uh, uh, the evolution is very nice. The one with uh, L, um, IL2R, uh, I cannot understand, but he did very nicely with, uh, with immune suppression for a long, for a, a year. And uh, now it's without any medications. Uh, it's uh, two years old and it's completely normal life. Uh, they, at yes. that time, we even could do the, the tests to see how the lymphocytes was working. It was a defect in lymphocytes, but that moved. And now the tests are showing very nice that we, some that he recovered the problem. And the XIAP, it's a child that uh, looks like a, a ulcerative colitis that uh, was, was excellent evolution with uh, mesalazine. It was around one year when we did diagnosis. And uh, it's, very nicely, the XIAP uh, is diagnosed, but we didn't change anything because uh, he's doing very nicely on mesolazine. But I would, I would like to ask the panel, the attenders, if anyone faced or has faced with the disease I told about, I, I would be interested because, because I am sure that uh, some should exist, but not well recognized, dying in a, in a local hospital early after birth and not transferred to a specialized center. But I am sure that you should have such disease because uh, whatever there is low rate of consanguinity in uh, Brazil, Brazil, for example, it's a large country and uh, there are some community and probably uh, some mutation have been introduced in the past and uh, are, are following their life and uh, with the, the consanguinity increase the incidence. And I am sure that it's a question of recognition of the disease much more than the absence of disease because these diseases again are certainly very frequent in some part of the world, but because of the migration, uh, they should uh, exist also in Latin America, both in Argentina, Peru, Brazil, et cetera, et cetera, Mexico. Thank you Thank very you. much, Professor Goulet. It yes. was a great lecture, and we will invite you next time. For, for giving a talk? Of course. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. It's, it's my pleasure. I love Latin America. I have, also, so, I have so many friends in Latin America. And also you have to come to, to, to America. I hope so. When <laughs> you want, when you want.